All right, we're going to go ahead and get started. Uh, first, I'd like to thank everyone for joining us this morning, and we're talking about our top 10 HR no-nos. Uh, just a reminder, this presentation is being recorded. You will be emailed a copy of this after, uh, so don't feel like you have to take a lot of notes. There's going to be a lot of words on the slide. That's intentional so that uh, when we go back and send it out to you, uh, you have the opportunity to have the information. Uh, disclaimer, this Presentation is to provide general information regarding this subject and is not explicitly constructed as providing any individualized advice concerning a particular circumstances. Our lawyers say to uh, keep this in here, just reminding you that this is general information and every uh, situation can always have unique circumstances that would differ uh, the recommendations on that situation. We like to start off by just reminding everyone who we are. So this is a free uh, educational session put on by Blue Lion. We are an outsourced human resource HR consulting company. We provide quality HR resources to local businesses. Um, we're real people with real personalities. We're also a pledge 1% company. Uh, we give 1% of our profit, service, and our time back to our community. Um, and we only provide people with services that they need. We're not the, uh, you know, block type uh, package type of a company. A little bit about myself. So I'm going to be your presenter today. I am one of the founders and co-owners of Blue Lion. Uh, I do have my master's in business from the University of New Hampshire. I love uh, my new role in our business as our business continues to grow. I do handle a lot of the business development a lot of networking uh, and really uh, the sales side of our business. When I am not growing our business, I do love to spend my time up in Maine. I love snowmobiling, mountain biking, and I am a dog mom. All right, we're gonna jump right in. Uh, we do have the chat feature open. So if as we're going, you do have questions, feel free to drop them in the chat. We'll try and address them as we're going. Um, but we can also follow up with people and individuals after the presentation as well. So our first HR no-no, not having an up-to-date or compliant handbook. This is definitely something you want to make sure you're having. So really the first question is, why do you need one? A uh, handbook is a great place for you to have, um, I call it the rules of the game. So this is a place where everyone can go to to understand how we operate in the sandbox what our employees can expect from us and what we as employers expect from our employees while we're playing in the sandbox, which is called work. It really sets parameters. It also provides guidelines so that everyone can be consistent. So making sure that all your mid-level managers know what's going on with your policies, making sure they're up to date with current legislation. There's been some changes in the last recent years. So making sure any language within your policies have been updated to reflect those local policies. Uh, and regulations. There's also state level regulations you need to make sure you're keeping up with. Um, another thing to keep in mind is if you are a multi-state employer. So I operate in multiple states uh, across the United States. I would need to ensure that I'm in compliance with all of those different states. A lot of us recommend doing that through state addendums. So you may have an employee handbook that's good for your state where your primary headquarters are, and then you add on addendums that are applicable for each of the individual states. So if you have employees working, you know, I'm located in New Hampshire, my policies are gonna be written for New Hampshire, but then I have a couple remote employees in Connecticut, I'm gonna have an addendum for those Connecticut employees that is only applicable to them. So really making sure you're keeping up to date on all of that type of legislation. You also wanna make sure your employees are signing off and acknowledging that they've read your handbook, that they understand the policies that are in them, and that they know that they have the opportunity to ask questions about said policies. You wanna make sure anytime you're making updates to your handbook, they're also signing off on those. Those signatures should be going into their employee files. So you do wanna make sure you're retaining copies of those signatures. A lot of times we recommend the final page of your employee handbook is the signature page that if your printing hard copy gets ripped out, uh, if you're electronic, um, sometimes you can even have this type of acknowledgement done through your payroll system. So some payroll systems will allow you to present the material, have them have to go through it, and then they can indicate that they've read and understand uh, the policies that are included and if there's any updates or changes. 
The other thing you really want to make sure that you're steering clear of is um, not following the policies in your handbook, which is why it's really important that you're keeping your policies up to date with your current practices. Sometimes we engage with clients and they're like, yeah, we haven't really looked at our handbook in five or 10 years. And we start going through it with them. And they're like, oh yeah, we don't do that anymore. Or no, we haven't done that in a long time. Or that's not the holidays we pay for. You want to make sure your handbook is is up to date um, so that you're not catching yourself in any situations where you're trying to hold somebody accountable for a portion of your handbook. And then they turn around and say, well, you're holding me accountable, but this says X, Y, Z, and you're not doing that. So really, are you picking and choosing the policies that you implement and, and uh, hold accountable? So really making sure that you're holding people accountable to the policies and you're actually living them. We like to think of handbooks as living and breathing documents that you need to make sure you're updating minimum of once a year, you're going through and reviewing, um, and then reaching out for any time that you need assistance. So not being afraid to reach out to an HR consultant or an employment lawyer even to just verify that you, your handbook is up to date where it needs to be. All right, next, lack of documentation on terminations. This gets us in a little bit of trouble. So in rare cases, an employee does something that's so ridiculous and so erroneous that they uh, need to be terminated immediately. Most times though, when we're terminating an employee, there are numerous opportunities that we could be addressing and documenting their undesirable or non-compliant behaviors, and it's critical that we're doing this. Recommend really educating our mid-level managers on what this means as well, so that they're gathering the information. There are gatherers, they're out there documenting, um, making sure that you have a process for documenting that fits to your business needs. So if you're not in an office atmosphere, let's say maybe you're a restaurant or maybe you're a trade and they're out in the field, giving your mid-level managers the tools that they need to be able to do it properly. An example of that with a lot of our trades partners, we recommend that they have a notebook in their truck um, that we actually have customized and printed that has their employee engagement. So when they're talking to an employee, it has the form in the, in the notebook. They fill out the form. It's already has the pre-sections in there. They rip it out and then they turn it into HR so HR can file it. You really wanna make sure anytime they're addressing performance in the field, it's getting documented. So make sure you're establishing those procedures so when it does come time for that termination, you have the proper documentation. This is going to limit the amount of times that you're being sued. Um, lawsuits are on the rise. The EEOC had over 67,000 charges filed in 2020. Most of them do result in a lawsuit. Um, so making sure you're not getting that wrongful termination claim and really having the documentation to support your decision. Um, as we say in HR, if it wasn't written down, it didn't happen. You also want to make sure that it very clearly states in the documentation that any additional violations may re result in further disciplinary action up to and including termination. You never want to be at the termination table when you're letting an employee go and have them feel like they're blindsided. If you're doing proper documentation and proper communication throughout the process and you're um, informing them of their areas of opportunity, what they need to improve, and that this is a severe, you know, severe instance and that it could lead to termination and giving them timeframes and sticking with your timeframes, uh, there really should be no shocks or surprises uh, when you're sitting to do a termination. But really making sure you're writing everything down. We also highly encourage a termination letter. So actually a document that you're providing to them upon termination that clearly spells out why you're terminating them. There's no guessing work when you're providing that type of document. Um, it clearly states what it's for. All right, next we're moving on to inconsistent and insufficient employee files and records. Um, have a defined policy and process, have a defined process of what we're retaining, when we're gathering it, how we're retaining it, who's retaining it, where is it being kept, all of the who, what, when, where, and why, uh, really outline it so everyone in the organization understands. Filing's not fun. Nobody likes a lot of paper, but it is necessary. It's especially necessary. You know, we just talked about terminations. That's one of the times that you're going to utilize those files. Um, you want to make sure every employee has a file. 
sometimes we'll come into businesses that have been established for 20, 30 years. And, you know, somebody works, Sally works there. She's been there for 40 years. We don't have a file. That's Sally. We don't have a file on Sally. Sally needs a file. Everyone needs a file. There's no bad time to start. So also don't feel like if you've never had files, you can't create them. You can absolutely create files after the fact. If you don't have them, today's a great time to start. Uh, really establish what that structure is going to look like and, and get the right documents in them. It is very uh, recommended, encouraged, and sometimes even restricted that you do keep certain files separate. Uh, we operate on typically a minimum of a four file system. Sometimes we even add additional depending on the industry field and, and things they're managing. Um, you always want to keep your medical documents separate. Those have a lot of private, private information. So medical I-9 is in, a, in another place. We're keeping I-9 separate. Those have a lot of social security. Sometimes you have copies of passports, driver's license. Uh, those things want to be kept a little extra secure. If you're doing anything such as background checks, any workman's comp paperwork, all of those things have very private information on them. You want to make sure you're keeping them extra secure and separate from their um, you know, sign off on their photo release or their uh, performance documents, their annual review documents, those can be should be kept separate from the really private information. You want to make sure it's secure. What do we mean by secure? This does not mean that it's kept in one person's office and nobody goes in the office. If that office is not locked every night or any time that person is not in their office, I would not classify that as secure. Highly recommend if you are paper filed still, that you do have it in a locked filing cabinet and that filing cabinet remains locked at any time. It is not actively being used. All too often we have clients that say, yeah, it's in the filing cabinet in you know, Bob's office, it's locked. We walk down to Bob's office and I open the filing cabinet. Oh, I must have forgotten to lock it. Always keep the filing cabinet locked. Definitely uh, an important thing. If you are keeping electronic files, that is absolutely acceptable. There is some HRIS or platforms out there um, payroll platforms that will help you to manage those type of files. You also could keep it on your intranet or your internal um, systems. Just make sure that you work with your IT systems and you make sure that everything is being held confidential and tested often. So I would recommend a minimum of quarterly having someone that should not have access, try and access those files to ensure that they're staying um, they're staying secure. You would hate to have some update that IT did or some system up software update that happened, all of a sudden unprotect your files and nobody's paying attention because we think it's not broken. So why are we trying to fix it? Uh, and then having everyone have access to those. So electronic is fine. Uh, just make sure that you're always keeping it up to date. And finally, making sure that you're following the laws and regulations with how long to keep files, how long are you retaining different documents. There are various documents that should be destroyed after termination based on certain amount, certain amount of time. Um, there are other things you have to keep for a very long time. So really making sure you know the legislation around that. It's not everything gets thrown out at, upon termination. There are some things that can be. So really looking in and making sure that you're only maintaining what you should for terminated employees. To add to that, it's also important to terminate files and to destroy them. You do not want to have 40 years worth of employee files you know, just in storage. That's a that's a security risk as well. So you want to make sure that you do have a, a process of destroying files when it's time to uh, for those terminated employees. But again, recapping, we just need to make sure we have in files, make sure they're kept secure, make sure you have the right information in the files, and it's never too late to go back and audit your files and really bring them up to up to speed. Next, we're gonna talk about lack of supervisor and manager training. Um, it's important that when you have mid-level management or even upper management, um, but most often this is a area of risk with your mid-level management, they don't necessarily understand their role in the organization. A lot of uh, small and medium-sized organizations promote from within. So you have an excellent customer service rep that then ends up growing and excelling and becoming the manager of the customer service department. Um, there are some of us that are born to manage, but most are not. Most did not have education to be a manager. They didn't go to school for management. Um, they really worked their way up the ladder and ended in a level of management, which is great, 
And it's not, we're not saying they're not appropriate for the role or adequate for the role. We just need to make sure that as an organization, we're investing the resources to make sure they have the tools necessary to do that portion of their job. Um, one of the things that really makes you a high risk is them not understanding regulations and laws that are applicable or that they are actually an agent of your business. Uh, all too often, we see companies get into sticky situations. And when it comes to the investigation part, we find out a mid-level mid -level manager knew about this far before upper management did. And the mid-level manager didn't realize it was their responsibility to report something or that you know they're just out to lunch with one of their coworkers who happens to be a subordinate and they notified them of something happening and that they're now been notified as the company. The company has been notified. Um, so it's really important that you're making the investment in training them on what their responsibilities are and how to know what to do when something happens. So we're getting into harassment training and, and uh, other management style trainings, but also don't be afraid to invest in communication training. A lot of times the personnel issues that arise can be avoided through simple acts of communication. So making sure your uh, supervisors and managers know how to handle situations, how to properly um, and professionally handle communication with staff given different situations, uh, and really investing in those type of trainings, doing maybe a, a quarterly training with your managers. And every quarter, it's a different topic. Also, highly encourage you to ask your managers, ask your supervisors what type of additional training they would like to see. And you'd be amazed at um, how elevated they become and how more invested they become in your organization because you're spending the time and investment on improving their skills as a manager. Poor hiring practices is where we're going to go next. Uh, the cost, estimated cost of replacing an employee is one and a half to two times an annual salary. Um, bad hires are also expensive. So it is expensive to hire somebody. It is expensive to recruit somebody. A bad hire can also be even more expensive. So not only did I spend all the time and effort to get you here, but now you're the bad apple spoiling my bunch. It's hurting my culture. You're not a great culture fit. Um, you wanna make sure that when you're going through the process of hiring, you are taking the time and investing it to make sure you get the right culture fit you have people that have the ability and the desire to grow with your company. They align with your company values. We strongly encourage all of our clients when hiring, you should be looking at your company values, your company mission. Does this person fit? Are they going to align with our culture? Culture and values are often more important than just skills. If you are solely hiring on skills, you will find a lot of times you're getting into water where you're finding someone that doesn't fit with your team and it ends up being a bad hire. They have the education experience and skills to do the job, but they're not a culture fit and then it ends up oil and water. It never ends up working out. Um, rely on um, different types of behavioral assessments like the predictive index, the Briggs, Myron Briggs. There's a whole bunch, disc assessment. There's a whole bunch of different assessments out there they can really help you establish what type of person you're wanting to put in the position. Predictive index even goes as far as allowing you and your manager, so HR, the man hiring manager, um, some different people in the organization to input in what this person should have for criteria, what kind of human they should be, what's going to excel in this position. And you can actually create a persona and then given a predictive index, when the applicant fills out the predictive index, it'll tell you the likelihood they are personality-wise to exceed in this position. Um, so there are some great tools out there that can really help with those behavioral assessments to get the right people in the right seats. Um, when you're doing reference checks, electronically doing reference checks for people oftentimes makes it easier for the person you're trying to get the information from to complete it. They're usually more honest and it you tend to get a, a better response rate. So when you're doing reference checks, don't just rely on the phone call. Feel, you know, be willing to also do the email, a form that they can fill out, um, and you'd be amazed at how quickly you're getting those back. Some questions we recommend asking yourself: um, Do you have a consistent and organized interview process? 
So first we want to start off with making sure we've got a great job ad out there, but then we want to make sure we have a consistent process for interviewing and hiring. Do we have a standard set of interview questions? Are they related to the essential functions of the job? So you may have a different set of questions you're asking depending on the role that you're hiring. You may be hiring and there's so many applicants. I know when we love that, we all love that. So many applicants that you can't interview all of them. You have to rely on your colleagues to interview or maybe the manager's doing some of the interviewing. Having set questions also helps you to better compare uh, candidates. So it's not just about how you like and feel the person, it's about how well did you answer these questions? How well did they answer? And we can look at the answers and compare them. Standard interview questions are also going to help to make sure your interviews are properly trained and asking the right questions. Anytime you have someone doing interviewing on behalf of your company, you want to make sure that they're trained in what they are able to ask, what they are not able to ask, what's appropriate for interviewing, what's not appropriate, um, and, and really making sure that they are protecting your business. You wanna make sure that um, you're not getting yourself open for any risk um, by asking inappropriate questions. Um, it can create uh, liability for discrimination and personal bias and can also lead to poor hiring. So you can also end up hiring the wrong people because you're asking the wrong questions. So really make sure that you have that hiring process nailed down um, so you're getting onboarded uh, faster and better candidates through the, the hiring process. Next, we're going to jump to misclassification of employees. It's another area that can be extremely costly. Uh, we do on this one recommend that you re reach out to either an HR consultant or an employment lawyer when you're doing uh, classification. You want to make sure you're getting this 100% right. This is not gym class. We're not just going to show up and get the A. You really need to make sure you are nailing this one 100% accurate uh, to avoid some very costly errors. So this is probably one of the most expensive HR mishaps that we have. Um, when we're talking about misclassifying, it's usually two different categories. The first is going to be misclassifying an independent contractor when they are actually in fact being treated and directed as an employee. We see that very often in the trades. We see it a lot of times with gig work. Um, so really making sure if you have an independent contractor or sometimes referred to as a 1099 versus an employee, sometimes referred to as a W-2, you wanna make sure you're getting those classifications correct. I will let you in on a little secret. You will never get in trouble for having a 1099 as a W-2 when they could have been a 1099. I'll repeat that. You can never get in trouble for having someone be a W-2 that could have been a 1099. So if you're like freaked out and you're like, I just wanna, I wanna do whatever is going to be the lowest risk possible, hire them as an employee and forget about the 1099. There are absolutely instances when 1090s are okay, uh, they're appropriate, they're, they make perfect sense. An example is my company, any one of our clients that hire us as an HR consultant, we are a true 1099, we are not employees. So um, there are times it does work, but definitely something that can get expensive. The second common misclassification is exempt versus non-exempt classification. I am gonna just go on a little sidebar and clarify that exempt and non-exempt is not the same as hourly and salary. Very often those two words get interchanged. If you have an hourly employee, so they're getting paid for each hour they work, they have an hourly rate of pay, they have to be non-exempt. They must be paid overtime. That does go there. However, when you get into salaried positions, so I am paying them the same amount of money regardless of the quantity or quality of hours provided during a pay period, they get the same amount of money, they can be exempt or non-exempt. So just be careful, just because you say salary does not mean it is uh, exempt. So when we're talking about exempt from overtime and other different types of uh, classifications, um, it really means that they're reducing the benefits and pay that they're getting, um, certain benefits they may not be eligible for, uh, things like that. So it's very important that you are going through the steps to classify if someone is eligible to be exempt. Uh, versus non-exempt. This, just like our first classification, uh, you can always have someone be non-exempt and not get in trouble. The things that you need to prove that you're able to do is the exempt. So exempt from paying overtime, exempt from some other things. 
um, it can definitely get very costly if you have someone classified as exempt that should have been non-exempt. Uh, the Department of Labor will go back and make you pay on backed wages, and then they usually uh, either double it or triple it for penalties. Uh, it gets very expensive. So making sure that you are going through that. Again, just recapping, always recommend on this one that you do get outside counsel, either an HR consultant or an employment attorney, uh, just to verify that you've got that one nailed down. All right, next we're going into incomplete or lack of job descriptions. Uh, show of hands, who loves writing job descriptions? No one, no one loves writing job descriptions, um, but it is worth the time. So the time that you're going to put into these job descriptions are going to be well worth it. Uh, we're going to run down a bunch of list of places where you're going to use them. So first, you're going to use them during the recruiting process. It's a detailed job description that's going to keep you on track of exactly what you need in a potential candidate. Make sure you're being realistic. So make sure your job description, if it's a requirement of the job that you have a four-year degree, Great, put it there. If it's not a requirement, don't put it as a requirement, put it as an additional benefit to have. Um, so make sure you're being realistic with your job descriptions, but it's great for your recruiting process. It's going to help the people that are interviewing with you or helping you with recruiting really know what skills your applicants need in order to be able to do this job effectively. Once you're an employee, your job description is going to help you with your performance reviews. So anytime we're doing a, a performance engagement, we're looking at how are you performing, I'm obviously going to compare you to your job description. Here's what you're supposed to be doing. How are you doing? Are you doing great? Are you not doing great? Um, it's really gonna help for those. That leads us into our counseling. So if you have somebody not doing great, we can always tie back to that job description. It's something they were provided upon hire, provided anytime it was updated, so they know it exists. They know what the expectations are, so they're clearly defined. So during those counseling conversations, we can talk about how the job description and what parts they're missing, and we can really point out where we need to see the improvements. Um, it also can be used um, as a, a tool when an employee requests a modification for their job due to a medical reason. So using a properly created job description when you're in uh, situations where you're talking about Americans with Disabilities Act, so your ADA compliance, you have to engage in that process of communicating about reasonable, reasonable accommodations. Um, essential functions of the job, it's, it's important to define what is an essential function of the job. Um, it's important to also in your job descriptions talk about the percentage of time that this is being done and um, how often, what's the repetition of this piece of the job. So there's a lot of components to creating a great job description. Um, but that final part that's going to really help you is when anyone's looking for some type of an accommodation. Um, you want to make sure you're having a consistent format throughout the entire company. We recommend, because it is a heavy lift, either outsourcing it to an agency like ours or have your mid-level managers help you in starting the process. So figure out what your structure is going to be, create a template give it to the manager, have them fill it out for all their you know, subordinates. What do you think this job description looks like? Take it back and really make sure you're nailing it down and making sure it has proper language. Make sure you're, they followed your format, that everything's where it should be. But every job description in your entire company should really follow that same format. And you should be penciling out or separating out what the essential functions are, what other functions are, um, requirements, educational requirements. Some people even put in their job descriptions kind of what the progression of the job looks like. So maybe this is a tier one installer, a tier two installer, a tier three, and what does it mean to go between the installer tiers? Um, so that's where you can really define that. But these are useful tools that are often overlooked, not created, or they're just created crappy. And then what's the point of having the tool? So definitely worth the time investment. As you saw, there's three different times that we're using it, if not more. Um, so worth, worth the investment. Next, we're going to lack of knowledge of applicable laws and regulations. Um, no one expects you to know it all except for the Department of Labor and the IRS. Uh, if you do not have someone that is focused on HR laws and regulations, you are putting your business and yourself at a huge risk. You want to make sure that someone is constantly looking at changes the last four years, there have been changes coming at a rapid pace. Um, I know when COVID happened, my business partner and I started 
you know, just doing quick YouTube videos to try and keep our, our clients up to date because things were changing so quickly. You really can't, you can't not pay attention to this. And if you don't have the internal resources, then it is something that we would recommend outsourcing and partnering with a firm like ourselves or an employment lawyer. There are also uh, newsletters that you can sign up for to kind of keep you up to date. You need to ensure that you have the right policies in procedures in place to help mitigate your risk. And to do that, you kind of need to know what those policies are. Another thing is also your payroll practices. So it is oftentimes clients think it's really easy to run your own payroll through do-it-yourself systems like QuickBooks, um, but there's a lot of moving parts with payroll. There's a lot of compliance involved when it comes to payroll. So you really want to make sure you know about all of those compliances. And if you don't, Maybe it's uh, time to contract with a professional payroll company or even a uh, tax consultant that is also willing to give you advice on your payroll processing um, and making sure that you're keeping up with current legislation. You also want to make sure you're not missing out on any tax incentives or any um, tax credits that might be, might be out there that you aren't aware of because you're, again, don't have your pulse on kind of the changing legislation. Right now, a really hot one is the ERTC, which is the Employee Retention Tax Credit. That one is starting to roll off and expire for 2020 filings, um, but that has to do with COVID and it has to do with um, the pandemic. Uh, so if you don't know about that one, definitely look into that one. But again, just making sure that you have someone that is able to focus on applicable laws and regulations, because again, the Department of Labor and the IRS they do not give any free passes for just not knowing, for not having the bandwidth or not having the staff to stay on top of everything. They do require from day one, when you hire your first person, you are responsible for keeping up with all of those laws. Um, next, we're going into not prioritizing annual compliance training. Compliance training is often viewed as boring. Um, it does add a lot of value to your company. Uh, by by training employees that become more knowledgeable about the regulations that we just talked about and their specific job roles, which we talked about in our mid-level management as well. See how some of these are tying together? Uh, it protects your organization from a variety of damaging consequences. Uh, compliance and ethics trainings is going to help your employees understand how to stay in compliance, follow the established rules. We never want to assume that something is common sense. As soon as you assume something is common sense, um, you're gonna get in trouble. So what may be, seem like common sense to you is not to others. Here's a great example. My background's in HR. A lot of it seems like common sense, but I'm also educated in HR. So it's simple for me. It may not be simple for others. Um, these trainings are gonna help your employees identify and report violations when they see them or any potential violations. It also is, can help them spot potential compliance issues uh, before it actually becomes a violation. Some ex examples of these type of trainings are HIPAA training, your OSHA trainings, there's harassment training, safety trainings. Um, so there's a lot of different compliance trainings that you can be offered. I recommend setting up quarterly trainings, every quarter going over something different. Um, again, back to our mid-level training, these are gonna kind of pair together. So some of them uh, can be on compliance. You can do some on uh, managerial stuff like that as well. So those really two really pair together, but making the investment in training is not going to be a dollar wasted. So the last one we're going to wrap up with is going to be our disorganized onboarding and orientation of new hires. So when you're, you know, before we had talked about the interview process, so making sure you have a good organized interview process, you're staying in compliant, we're not getting any trouble there. Now we're going to talk about once we've hired them. So you're going to spend so much time and effort and money getting them. Then what? Then what? Solid onboarding strategies do, they don't have to be complicated. They can be Simple, simple is great. Uh, most successful companies start their onboarding prior to the employee's first day at work. So the onboarding process is not just, okay, you're gonna start on Monday, we'll worry about you on Monday. We actually start that process before you come in. Um, it's important first that we know the difference between orientation and uh, onboarding. So orientation is for new hires, it's usually a one-time event that's going to welcome them going to tell them about your company. You might go over your mission, your values, your history, the organizational chart. It's really going to just be a, a session. 
So a one to two hour session that we're really going over orientation about who we are as a company and how do we get to where we are. Your onboarding is actually a, a series of job specific trainings, meetings, events. It can include the orientation, um, but it is going to be a whole process that's going to make it your new hires more successful. Um, you want to make sure when they get there, they feel like there's an organized process. There's nothing worse than showing up on your first day to a new company and you have no desk. You have no computer. Be prepared for your new hires. It is hard to hire out there. We are still in a, a tight labor pool. You want to make sure you're making that first great impression that that new hire feels like you were ready for them. We were ready for this. And if you create an onboarding process, you're just rinsing and repeating every time. We're not recreating wheel. We're investing the time to create the process and then we're just rinsing and repeating each time. Some of the things you might include in your onboarding might be lunch with a manager. It might be meeting with different coworkers throughout the organization. Maybe you have a lunchroom and they get assigned lunch buddies throughout the first week. It could be uh, how they're job shadowing, who they're job shadowing. So really structuring out with that first few weeks and maybe even months of their uh, employment works. That's gonna wrap us up uh, for our top 10 HR no-nos. As a reminder, we are going to be sending this out uh, in an email to everyone that signed up and joined us today. Uh, so you will get a copy of this training. I haven't had any questions pop into the chat. So I'm just gonna wrap up with reminding you that we are here to help. So if anything that we talked about today, you're like, ooh, I probably could use some help on that. Feel, reach, feel free to reach out to us. These are all things that we can also help you with. Um, or if even if you have them, maybe you've already invested the time and you've got great job descriptions and you're just wanting someone to take a second look, we can do that kind of review type stuff as well. Um, and then here is all of our contact information. And I want to thank everyone for taking the time to jump on with us. We like to always keep it a little bit under the hour. Uh, we know we're all busy professionals, so we give you a little bit of time back in your morning to go grab that cup of coffee. Uh, and take a mental break. So have a great day. Thanks for joining us.